and welcome to your January edition of Essential Cardano 360, your monthly roundup of just some of the latest news and developments from across the Cardano ecosystem. Now, before we dive in, please make sure you like, subscribe and hit that bell icon to get all the latest and greatest news about Cardano from the team at IOG. So it's a new year and with all the building happening across the ecosystem and the acceleration of the Cardano governance journey, 2024 is looking set to be our busiest year yet. And as the building continues, we'll hear from some of the creators behind Noom, Zengate and Ergo's Rosenbridge a little later in the show. Plus, Matthias and Arnaud will be joining us for more details on the upcoming Builderfest developer conference that's happening in Toulouse this spring. As we head into voting for Fund 11, there'll also be a quick update from the Project Catalyst team. But first up, as we head into 2024 and the next phase of the governance journey, let's get an update from Intersect's Jack Briggs and Christian Taylor. It's January 2024 and the Intersect team are in London to have a bit of a brainstorm and planning session ahead of what is going to be a momentous year for Cardano in 2024, particularly all around its governance. There has been quite a few changes to Intersect's knowledge base, so I wanted to share a bit of an update on all of that and also share a bit of news, exciting news, about an annual members meeting happening later in 2024. So just to recap on what many of you already know, Intersect launched last July and Intersect and its members play a really important and integral role in shaping the proposed on-chain governance design and the mechanisms and the development of off-chain processes and tools to support it. Part of that has been a huge amount of work with committees in 2023. We've had five committees been stood up by members already so far, and there'll be two further committees uh, at least into 2024. That's the Budget and the Vision Committee, which will be looking to set a budget for Cardano into 2025. So super exciting work that Intersect is kicking off uh, again in 2024 and continuing with all the good stuff that's been happening in 2023. With the vision and budget committee being established in 2024, there are two concepts that have been introduced in 2023 and will continue. That is the Cardano continuity or the continuity of Cardano. And that's the sort of here and now, the day-to-day -day maintenance and management of the Cardano network from a day-to-day -day perspective. And essentially, you can define continuity as um, it can include new development, such as the SIP 1694 governance software or upgrades to components and other improvements in testing environments and various other sort of functionality that exists day to day. And then you've got vision on the other hand, though, which is pertaining to new functionality uh, or new features that may be in research phase or the community want to see developed into the future. Uh, both of uh, continuity and vision are uh, sort of two tracks, two components of Cardano's development, with the vision roadmap being worked on via the vision committee and in collaboration with the budget committee making sure that those two things line up so that we're pressing ahead with Cardano into 2025. So just some of the big updates that we've done in January has been a big update to the knowledge base. We have published a large update on the governance structure, talking about the governing board and including bylaws for Intersect, which members can sort of read and understand exactly the shape and structure of how Intersect is going to do its thing as a not-for-profit organization um, for uh, as a member-based organization. The other really important, exciting news is the annual members meeting that is planned for the second half of 2024. This will be where members are invited to participate both virtually and in person, where we can focus on intersex activities, affairs, including voting on motions wherever applicable. Details of the annual members meeting will be communicated later in the spring this year. One thing that members may have missed and the Cardano community may have missed was a huge milestone for Cardano that happened just before Christmas. The core Cardano code base, which is roughly 25 repositories, were moved to Intersect. And that's a massive milestone where now members are maintaining those code bases. I'm joined by Christian Taylor, the head of the open source program office at Intersect, where he can elaborate a little bit more. Hi, everyone. My name is Christian Taylor. I am the head of the Open Source Program Office at Intersect. Thank you, Jack, for the intro. As he was mentioning, in December of last year, we had the first important milestone for Cardano about moving the source code, the 26 repos that represent core Cardano, over to Intersect. And with that being said, we also have an important thing related to that, which is the Open Source Committee, which will help represent my function and give me guidance on behalf of the member base 
to help maintain fine suppliers and build upon these core Cardano repos. The committee itself has already had 16 sessions in total, and it's comprised of members of core suppliers and community members. They themselves are already working on some basic things that every open source foundation needs to have. We actually have, in fact, our first in-draft governance policy hosted on our GitHub under the community tab that we are actively encouraging the community to come and engage and help us draft that to a final state for the committee to ratify, which will be best guidelines for how we are going to govern and manage the repos. We also have other initiatives as well as buying into the open source strategy, which is the next important milestone for the committee, as well as the OSPO and Intersect as a whole, because that will be our governing strategy for how we take Cardano and make it fully open source. And just to help alleviate any concerns about this open source initiative is that we are not inventing anything from the ground up. We are putting ourselves in line with best practices from other existing foundations and looking to form strategic partnerships with those ecosystems as well to help take us to the next level. We actively encourage everyone to engage, and we also have a public Discord. It's the OSC Feedback, OSC standing for Open Source Committee channel on our Discord, and we are actively engaging there daily, so feel free to jump in. We also have two more exciting policies that will be announced coming up for community feedback as well. We meet regularly right now every Friday from 4 to 5 UK time, so feel free to jump in in one of our public meetings. So thanks to Jack and Christian for that and for the latest governance updates from Intersect. Sign up for their newsletter and join the monthly town halls. You can find the links below and don't forget to follow the team on X at Intersect MBO. We introduced David Harding, the general manager for Atala, to you a few months ago. But since then, the team has been hard at work with a number of updates, improvements and collaborations. Here's David with an update and a little more about what's on the horizon for the team. Hello, I'm David Harding. I'm the general manager of Atala, a business unit inside of the Input Output Group. Atala is focused on self-sovereign identity as defined by the W3C or World Wide Web Consortium's Decentralized Identifier Specification. So what do we do at Atala? Well, we're the proud developer of the Atala Prism SSI platform. Atala Prism, I'm proud to announce, has been released into the Hyperledger Labs. And we're currently on a monthly cadence of release. In fact, our security audit for version 2.6 is to be completed very shortly. We've already released 2.7 and 2.8, and 2.9 is going to be available at the end of January. Atala Prism really focuses on your ability as a decentralized application developer or a service developer on top of the Cardano ecosystem to be able to implement digital identity in the form of self-sovereign identity directly into your applications. We do this by supporting the SSI specifications such as DIDCOM. In fact, we support DIDCOM version two. We support verifiable credential issuance, both the non-creds and JWTs, and other capabilities such as selective disclosure of personally identifiable information. We go even further by providing other capabilities such as multi-tenancy. So on the platform, you can actually have multiple tenants with multiple identities in each tenant and manage them individually. We have APIs and SDKs for direct integration and rapid consumption of the SSI Prism platform directly into your dApps and services. We also have a burgeoning community, both consumers of the platform and contributors of the platform. And there are multiple ways we support that community. We do so through our Discord channels. We have full documentation of our APIs, our SDKs, and we have full training on how to use the Prism platform and how to directly consume it into your dApps and services. And we're really excited about the road ahead. Our roadmap includes things like support for OpenID Connect, revocation of a non-cred and JWT credentials, and key recovery, did recovery, and key rotation. Also, we're adding a number of scalability optimizations. So as your user base grows, you can rely on Prism to be able to support it in a scalable and effective way. And finally, we're developing a series of UI tools, dashboards, administrative capabilities to be able to manage your Prism installation, as well as the identities that have been issued through the PRISM platform. In the coming year, we're also going to be very excited to announce our ID as a service. 
So you can incorporate the Atala Prism platform and all the SSI capabilities that it provides directly into your dApps and services without having to manage the SSI platform directly. This is going to be a great advance for developers who are developing their solutions on top of the Cardano platform to be able to add identity without having to take on the responsibility of managing yet another platform. As an active member of the Cardano community, we attend many of the Cardano events. This year will be no different. In fact, we're expanding the number of events that we participate in to include those around digital identity. We look forward to seeing you there. We look forward to interacting with you and talking to you about how you can integrate digital identity directly into your dApps and services. We want to encourage you to become part of our community. For information, please join us at atalaprism.io. Everything you need is there to be able to join our community and engage with us on our journey towards self-sovereign identity. So thanks to David for that. And if you missed the news about the recent Hyperledger announcement, make sure you check it out using the link below. Catalyst Fund 11 is well underway, and at the time of recording, the team was preparing for voting to kick off in just a few days. Chris Baird and Danny Rebar joined us to give an update on what's been happening since the new year and what lies ahead for the Catalyst community. Hello, everyone. This is Daniel and Chris from the Catalyst team today. We're very excited to bring a round of updates with regards to the Fund 11 that is just about entering the voting stage and hoping that many of you are going to be participating once again to help prioritize which projects should be funded in this iteration cycle. But wait, before we do, maybe we can refresh very quickly, Chris, what is Project Catalyst for those who may be learning about it for the very first time right here, right now? Thanks, Danny, and hello, everyone. Sure, well, Catalyst is Cardano's turbocharged innovation engine that takes the potential of human creativity and ingenuity, matches it with the power of the crowd and funding that comes from Cardano's treasury. Well, what does that mean? Well, Catalyst is an innovation grants program like no other, where anyone can submit a great idea into the fund, so long as it's for the benefit of the Cardano ecosystem. The community will then review those proposals and ultimately vote to decide which of those proposals should receive funding. So whether it's a proposal for a new DAP or another software project or perhaps some education initiative to onboard new users to Cardano, ultimately the power of decision making is in the controls of the community. Great summary, Chris. So as you may have heard in and around the ecosystem, a lot of new changes and improvements have been made just like every fund. And this one was no different. The weather is from the eligibility criteria for proposers to consider when applying and introducing a concept of a track record for each one of them. Improvements in various policy changes and milestone based funding implementation where proposers demonstrate their progress via proof of achievement or even improving the likes of voting. In fact, this funding round, everyone will be presented with two options in each project card to vote yes or to vote abstain. The infamous no votes are currently disabled in Fund 11 round and what will matter the most is the total yes votes cast on each proposal. We also recommend choosing a number of abstain votes to ensure you increase the privacy preserving elements of your choices in each category. Team and community will observe the outcomes and take a data driven approach once again for Fund 12 iteration when required. However, there are more improvements on the horizon and you may have heard there are now at least two improvement proposals, both uniquely targeted to advance the state of the art in Catalyst, one about researching the advanced decision-making voting methods and other about the concept of Catalyst working groups. But I trust Chris knows more about them. Chris, can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, sure. So touching on the alternate voting schemes proposal first, this is a collaboration we're ex really excited about collaborating with FOTREC, a community governance group, as well as also IOG's cryptographic researchers. Really, this is to bring about a revolution to decision making within Catalyst. Currently, we are bound by one ADA, one vote to determine how votes are cast. And this proposal will seek to extend our uh, voting protocols and mechanisms and do the cryptographic research required to ensure that they are secure, robust and can maintain high integrity within the context of Catalyst. The second proposal is Catalyst Working Groups and this is 
all about reinvesting resources into the community to establish community infrastructure to help to define and discuss and ultimately determine what should be the funding priorities for Catalyst in the future or perhaps what are the sorts of parameters that could change in order to make Catalyst even more impactful or, or even what can we do to bring uh, new incubators, accelerators and other sorts of investors into the ecosystem. These are all three pillars of interest that the Catalyst Working Group's proposal seeks to address and if you are interested in this proposal there's a brand new blog that's been published with details on how you could apply to become a Catalyst Working Group host yourself which would mean receiving compensation assuming the proposal is approved by the community and contributing towards helping to determine the future of Catalyst funding rounds. Again, that's a great collaboration proposal that we're really excited about in collaboration with Rare Network and Sustainable Ada, who as uh, the project team in, in tandem with us will be helping to facilitate and coordinate all of this great global coordination effort that the Catalyst Working Groups will produce. So with that, I'll hand back to you, Danny. Thank you, Chris. This all sounds very exciting. Catalyst is always looking to improve and iterate with every round. Looking forward to how Fund 11 and beyond shapes up once again. As always, you'll be able to find about 900 projects in the running in Fund 11. So you don't have to vote on everything. Choose those that you find most interesting. Filter by new options such as themes inside the voting app or leverage community tooling such as lightonation.com slash catalyst for some of the more advanced searching and parsing of the data or share the voting pick lists with one another with your own rationale, maybe shaping up those DREP skills already. So to wrap up, don't forget that the voting is now fully underway as of today and will be open for two weeks until February 8th, 11 a.m. UTC. If you haven't already, make sure to update or reinstall your voting app to the latest version and use your latest valid QR and PIN code to connect your wallet and you should be ready to go. If all goes well, we should know the results by the mid of the next month around February 15th. And remember, the whole vote can also be followed with the periodic snapshots for verification in real time. All of this information, how to follow and help verify and eventually validate the results once tally is announced you can find all on our knowledge base, docs.projectcatalyst.io. Other than that, you can always come spend time with the community every Wednesday at 5 p.m. UTC at weekly Catalyst Town Halls, which is a great way to get conversation going every week. And that's it. So thank you for your time, and we wish you both on behalf of the Catalyst team happy voting. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. So thanks to Chris and Danny, as ever, for all your tireless work and, of course, to the wider community for making Catalyst what it is. IOG's Arno Bailey and Matthias Bencourt from the Cardano Foundation will be familiar to many of you in the Cardano developer community from their work on Hydra, Mithril, Akin and much, much more. And as part of their ongoing contribution to Cardano's community of builders, they're organising Build-A-Fest in Toulouse this spring in April, a two-day event for Cardano developers to connect showcase and share. With the attendee list filling up fast, we invited them both onto the show to share more about what you can expect from the event and also how to register. Welcome Arno and Matthias to Cardano 360. It's great having you on the show. I hear that you've been putting together a two-day event for the community on the 23rd of April in beautiful Toulouse. Can you tell me a bit more about who's going to be at the event, who it's aimed at, and what it's for? Yeah, as the name implies, this event is really targeted at the builders of and the builders on Cardano. So both the people who are uh, actually building Cardano itself, and we hope that we can bring in uh, people that contribute to the core technology of Cardano from the, from the core team, from, from the smart contract uh, language from Plutus, for, for the ledger, from the ledger, and also a, a very diverse crowd from, from, from the, the people who are actually part of the ecosystem and building on top of it, whether it's applications, uh, websites, and, and this kind of stuff. We purposely didn't call that a developer fest because we thought builder was a bit more inclusive as, as, as a general term to qualify you know, tech savvy people that are interested in, in building stuff. So that also covers people that love fiddling with infrastructure or systems like, you know, SPOs or builders at large that don't necessarily see themselves as, as developers. Fantastic. That sounds amazing. Um, what's the format of the event? 
So it's a two-day event, which takes place in, in an hall, in a hotel. Uh, we wanted this to have a welcoming place and create the space and time for people to really interact. Uh, so the first day is a, is a classical dual track conference type of event with uh, various talks that have been proposed by the committee. So the, there is a call for proposal, which is uh, still up and running. And the second day is what we call an open space, which is a kind of home conference, which is much more free from and provides opportunity for anyone really from the committee, any, any participant to propose discussions, engage with all, all the other participants. So much more um, egalitarian way of sharing information and learning and, and sharing stuff. That's great. Um, what kinds of talks are going to be covered on the first day? We have four different types of talks and they are divided in two categories. So we have uh, workshops and talks. And on both cases, we have a lightning version of them. So that means a shorter version if you know you don't want to fill a whole 45 minutes with a presentation. So the talks are you know, someone presenting a particular topic that's dear to them. So they are a bit more passive and the workshop is for people that want to be more hands-on and have other, you know, also engaged in, in, in an activity. We have so far a bit of everything that has been submitted. We haven't the full agenda yet because the call for proposal is still up and running until the end of February, so 24th of February. So by that time, we will know exactly what the agenda is, have selected you know, the two tracks that will be running in parallel. So that's, you know, if someone doesn't necessarily like a particular uh, one, they can go for the other track that happening at the same time. And yeah, so very exciting. Everything so far revolves around building dApps, smart contracts on Cardano and, and, and so on with a variety of technologies, uh, which makes it even more interesting. So we are looking forward to it. There are still more proposals coming basically every week. So exciting times. That sounds brilliant. Where can I find out more? The, the main entry point to the conference is the website. So it's biddle.2024.canon.org where biddle is B-U-I-D-L. A nice meme from the community and from the blockchain space. So that's, that's where the registration takes place and uh, the, the, that's where you will find all the information about, about the conference. Is there a Twitter account there as well that we can follow uh, to hear news as it unfolds? Yes, correct. There is a Twitter account which is builder underscore fest where we publish regular updates and we try to also answer people that have questions and that reach out to us by that media. Maybe something that's worth mentioning about the registration process, that which is a small interesting twist, is that uh, the registration takes place on the website, so you can go there. And then the actual registration and payment of the registration fees uh, will be done through a Cardano transaction. So uh, prepare your wallet and, uh, or your Cardano CLI and be ready to, uh, to, to craft a transaction with some official metadata to make sure that you will have your, uh, your seat at the conference. So thank you, uh, Arno and Matthias there. And we look forward to seeing everybody at the Builder Conference uh, in uh, April later this year. Thank you. See you there. Thank you for having us and see you there in a couple of months. So Build-A-Fest will be a great opportunity for anyone looking to network, share their experiences and grow their technical knowledge while being surrounded by other innovators. So don't hodl off any longer. Get your ticket today. And if you fancy speaking at the event, the call for speakers ends on the 24th of February. You'll find all the links below. Continuing on the theme of builders, Matthew sat down with Florian from Noom, the company that's not only distributing music to outlets like Spotify, but is in the process of tokenizing the ownership of future royalties into artists and fans' wallets. Zengate stopped by to share more about their transformative work. Last but not least, we'll hear from Joseph Arminio from the Ergo Foundation and Rosenbridge, an open source protocol for cross-chain asset transfers. Florian, thanks for being with us on the show. Uh, can you give us an introduction to yourself and also to Noom? Hi, I'm Matthew. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Florian, the co-founder and co-CEO of Noom. Noom is building a fair ecosystem for musician and artist on top of Cardano. So can you take us a little bit deeper into the platform? What is it? What we have built so far and which is right now live on the mainnet as a beta test version for a specific group of artists is a distribution service. So like other distribution service in Web 2.0, we take your music as an artist and distribute it to 130 plus outlets like Spotify, Apple Music, collect the royalties and distribute the royalties. But at the same time, we are tokenizing the ownership 
about the future royalties into your wallet. So whoever holds these tokens, we call them stream tokens, in their wallet will be able to claim the royalties if the music ever generates some. Additionally to this, we are planning for this year a mobile app and, of course, a marketplace where you not only can gift it, but even sell these stream tokens as an artist if you want. It's really up to the artist. We are just offering services to the artist. And I think this is a really cool new way of interactions between artists and fans. Yeah. And so how do listeners uh, benefit from the system? As a listener, I think there are multiple ways, certainly, how you can benefit. Whoever holds the stream tokens can claim the generated royalties from the song. We as a decentralized system, we don't know who is behind it. It can be the artist or a fan, for example. I think there are even more and better ways. It's not just this monetary incentive. I think it's really being a part of the journey with the artist and seeing how such a song might be successful or not. But I think that the even better way is certainly for the artist. If you know people have these stream tokens in their wallet, you can token gate everything you want. It's like gives them voucher, airdrop voucher, gives them access to tickets, because you know if let's assume you're an artist, you have 100 songs out there, and one of your fans holds, I don't know, let's say to 99 of them, 10% of each song. Highly likely this is your mega fan. You know it already. It doesn't matter who is behind it. It's a mega fan. They love you. So you should, you should help them to be part of the community. You actively invite them to events. You should actively bring them into your community. But not only this, you can also suddenly think about, okay, I know, for example, geolocation data, and I'm on a tour. And I know, for example, in the specific area, a lot of people holding these stream tokens for a specific song. You should include this song in your tour because it's highly likely that someone who holds it is in the crowd. So they're more excited about hearing of the song, you know, because they're more emotional attached to it. Suddenly you can really form this strong community about around these songs and can just become a better artist by using the analytic data. And so if Noom is successful to its fullest potential, how does the music industry and even the music experience change? It's a really immersive experience where you're not only a listener to the music of the artist, but more of a kind of co-owner. But let's put it this way. You are with the artist in the same boat because when the artists might be successful, you're sitting there, you help them, you can suddenly do marketing for the artist and you're not doing it for free because you get part of the streaming royalties if the songs create some. Though suddenly doing this marketing for the artist makes sense. And I think that's the key about Neum as well. It's really combining Web3 with Web2. This is what we are doing in the first step. And to answer the second part of the question, to dive a little bit deeper, is if we are really successful, what does it mean for the music industry? Right now in the music industry as an artist, you have two options. Stay independent, do everything by your own, or go to a label. But there is not a third option, and this is what we are building. Having a music ecosystem owned by artists and fans and decide what they want to do with it. So can listeners and artists participate in this right now? Oh, yeah, definitely. Though everyone from the Cardano community can go to Spotify straight away and go to our playlist because Neum created a playlist of all the songs which are distributed through us already. Because if you listen to C songs, then every royalty generated by C songs will run through the Cardano blockchain as as a transaction because we have to distribute the royalties which is great and will generate 
uh, some transactions for the Cardano blockchain. So where, where is Numat right now in development and what can people look forward to? So we have been on testnet last year, developed structure, developed the backend processes because distribution of music is not a simple task. Everyone thought it would be, it's a little bit more tricky, but uh, we managed to do this, especially without touching any royalties. I think that's key. All the royalties were generated on Spotify, go 100% to whoever holds the stream tokens from this particular song. We are not taking any, any cut out of it, which is unique in the music industry ecosystem. And then we are on the mainnet right now with a few artists who went through the whole process. So at the time of this recording, we have now three songs successfully minted and distributed through the new system without the proof of concept. And we will opening up soon to 800 artists. And then the next step is to opening up to 1100 artists. So everyone who signs up to our newsletter and agrees to become an early tester as an artist will be the first who can really test it. And so far, all the feedback is, is great. It's as simple as you use a web 2.0 product. The only difference you have to put your wallet address in, that's it. And I think that's a great feedback so far. Of course, after 1100, opening up to the public. Last but not least, you can go to our stake pool, support us by delegating to our stake pool. Our ISPO is still running there. So if you want to, yeah, help us out to build it because it's really community owned, community funded so far, you're more than welcome to do so. Amazing. Well, Florian, thank you so much for being with us on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Matthew. It was a great pleasure to talk to you today. So Daniel, Theodore, thanks for joining us on the show. Can you tell the audience who you are? Yes, it's a pleasure being here uh, on the show. My name is Theodore, and I'm the lead biz ops of Zengate. So my name is Daniel Friedman, and I am the founder and CEO of Zengate Global. And can you tell us a little bit more about Zengate? Zengate Global is a technology provider. We are also the builders of the Palmyra platform, which is the first physically settled tokenized commodities exchange that is being built on Cardano and Ergo. So we're using both chains and yeah, it's, it's a very exciting product. This is what kind of gets us out of bed in the morning. So I heard you were in Sri Lanka recently. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> quite a bit, quite a bit happened in Sri Lanka in 2023. So we started off the year with a set of workshops, which were with producers, with our Palmyra Pioneer producers, to really understand what solutions are the most exciting for them, what solutions are the ones that they're really looking to utilize the most. And after that, we went back a little less than a month ago for a set of workshops with the Sri Lankan Tea Board, so hosted by Sri Lankan Tea Board, Again, with the bulk of the tea producers and tea factory owners, and so basically just people that are really influential and important in the tea industry with funding that we actually received from Catalyst. So this is actually the community helping us make this happen. This was part of our rapid onboarding of tea producers Catalyst Fund proposal that we submitted uh, that we got funding for. So thank you very much to the community, which essentially was designed to build a rapid onboarding blueprint for projects and for basically builders that are looking to uh, roll out jurisdiction-wide solutions. So again, this was very exciting for us. We got a lot done and yeah, we're looking forward to continuing on this journey. That is really exciting and really cool to hear that the Catalyst community helps you out with that. Uh, I also heard that you were in Turkey recently. What happened there? I spent almost a month in Turkey. During that time, I made connections into the uh, hazelnut and almond industry, which is actually 80% of all hazelnuts in the world come from Turkey. They're produced in Turkey. And so the problem that Turkey is mainly facing is kind of a value shifting away from the producer. Essentially in Turkey, what happens is while 80% of all hazelnuts are produced in Turkey, the actual value is moved somewhere else. It's moved to the UK, it's moved to Europe, it's moved to the US because they have the financial tools to utilize things like futures and forward contract trading. They can provide logistics, they can provide all these different things, they can provide manners of digitization that might not have been available in Turkey at the time when these particular work streams were, were created. 
And so what Turkey is looking to do, just like Sri Lanka, is to bring this value back. And so this is what Palmyra provides for them. It provides the opportunity to bring the value back and to give the producer and the local MSME the tools to play with the big boys, to have access to the world market. So what role does Palmyra play in bringing that value back to places like Sri Lanka or like Turkey? In the blockchain movement, we have, uh, you know, big ideas and we're looking to have mass impact. So basically it's, it's about impact, right? So, I mean, the core of it, the core of Cardano, if you think about it, if you remember, it's all about impact. It's all about financing the unfinanced, connecting the unconnected and bring an opportunity to ones that were denied the opportunity through reasons, right? That we're not gonna get into too much. But again, this, that, that's what the decentralization movement and blockchain movement is all about. And so what we're looking to kind of capture here is we're, we always talk about mass adoption in this movement. And so what does mass adoption look like? How do you onboard a country? You know, how do you onboard an industry? How do you onboard a group instead of just one? This is actually along the lines of something that I heard a keynote speaker say at the Crypto Expo in Dubai last year in September, which, which I also attended. And so this person spoke right before me and they said that currently the problem is that we're building solutions for thousands when we should be building solutions for billions. So essentially that is where the thinking behind this comes from is we're looking to build solutions for millions and billions. And that's what this is about. That's what onboarding jurisdictions is about. This what onboarding industries is about. So when you talk about physically settled tokenized commodities, oftentimes the physical world and the blockchain world seem pretty far apart. So how do you tie the benefits of blockchain like decentralization, cryptographic security or consensus to the physical world? That's a great, great question. If I will, I'm just going to break it really quick into these three kind of points that you came up with. So in terms of decentralization, you know, we all understand that, you know, the system allows everyone to have control and not just one single entity. And this is something that is really crucial, especially to the commodities market, because this is where, you know, trust and, and transparency are really, you know, important for them. So if we were to have a decentralized ledger that records these transactions, you understand that you know, there's no single party that can manipulate any data. So at the same time, you build the trust between you know, the producers and the buyers that are talking to each other. The other big thing is that you know, there's a lot of people in between the, the, the producer and the buyer, right? So you know, cryptographic security is another corner store that the blockchain technology brings uh, into the game. And that actually ensures that there's integrity and there's actually immutability of the data. Data is something that is really, really important in the commodity space. And when we talk about commodities, all we think about is you know, that physical item, whatever that might be, an agricultural, uh, it could be gemstone or, or minerals, but essentially it's the data that's something very, very important is the data that comes with that physical real world asset. And now lastly, just to touch a little bit, you know, on the consensus, this is what we need in terms of assurance, right? We want to make sure that, you know, whatever data has been entered into the system, all the way from beginning all the way to the end is immutable. There is trust between the producers, the buyers. So the approach that we use is abstraction. So what we do is we use blockchain when it makes sense. And really Palmyra, the Palmyra platform is a combination of Web 2, Web 2.5 and Web 3. Some of our solutions are not on chain, but they're still solutions like, for example, the special rate card we're able to negotiate with FedEx and with DHL to be able to bring the artisan and the specialty tea producers, the smaller producers, the MSMEs, uh, the ability to, to airship their teas at literally half the price, raising their margins, increasing portability of their businesses, profitability of their businesses. And of course, the Web3 solutions that are, they just make sense. And you just don't, you don't talk about it. And this is, again, something that might hurt for the, for us, 
because we're so passionate about Cardano. But the mainstream doesn't really care about Cardano. They care about the solution that Cardano brings. And that's what you have to approach it as. You can't approach a tech first. You have, to, you have to approach these people utility first. We didn't come to them and say, oh, look at all the decentralization. Look at all the blockchain. Look at all the do a, all this blockchain stuff. We came to them and we said, we can give you an easier access to traceability. You need traceability to be able to go through the process of export and import into other countries. You need transparency. This solution gives you that transparency that, that will bring you dollars into Sri Lanka because they want dollars in Sri Lanka. That's going to bring you dollars. You're going to have better transparency. They're going to know that they're getting their tea from that single source farm or plantation that your, your, your family's owned for generations and takes pride in. So that's what it brings. You bring them solutions. Uh, you bring them logistics solutions. You bring them, you bring them a, an intuitive logistics chain. You bring them options for, for payment, different options for quicker settlements, for lower settlements. You give them options for decentralized trade financing. Now, do I explain that it runs on DeFi and CeFi? Do I explain what DeFi and CeFi does? No. And this is a lot more de-risk than a lot of things that are happening in the Web3 DeFi space. These are real businesses. These are real commodities. And it just makes your livelihood better. And that's what you bring to them. That's how you do it. So if Palmyra is successful to its fullest potential, how does the world change? The world changes because um, there's now more transparency and more access to real commodities, to real data, to real value. What we're actually building is not just a T-trading platform. We're building a full suite hub and spoke commodities exchange. So think of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, but in the 21st century with all the bells and whistles of a Web3 and more. Think about that. And so better trade means better livelihood. More fair trade means more a better livelihood. And really, the success of Palmyra is going to mean the success of the MSMEs that we are looking to accommodate and we want to accommodate with this platform because essentially that's where the bulk of production happens is with MSMEs. And that's where the bulk of disparity and opportunity happens is within the SMEs. And so if they do better, we do better. If we succeed, they succeed. It just, yeah, it's just a better way of doing business. It's, it's, it's a more inclusive way of doing business. And it's just better all around. Every, I, I think everybody wins in a way with doing business this way. And that's what success means for us. So we've entered a new year. It's 2024. What's up next for Zengate? Oh, gosh, lots, <laughs> lots coming up. So, of course, currently we have the ISPO running. So Palm 1 and Palm 2. Palm 1 is the 99% pool. Palm 2 is a 50% pool. And this is uh, getting things ready for the launch of the Palm economy, uh, which is the, the token and the token economy that is going to be kind of the, uh, the financial fuel of the Palmyra platform. And we take pride in these tokenomics because... This was actually created with the help of Zero One X, the same company that created tokenomics for World Mobile. And we're big friends and fans of World Mobile. Yeah, so uh, we are going to attend the World T Expo once again in March. Uh, we're going to be there the same place. Uh, we're going to have a booth. We're going to be dealing with the industry once again. This time with a V2 of the product that we're going to be launching at some point next month. So this is, uh, again, coming up next month. We have streamlined the tokenization and traceability protocol, the winter protocol. We have added a lot of different payment options, streamlined those, increased speed, increased stability. All around, it is an amazing iteration of the, of, of the entire platform. So that's coming next month. Beyond that, of course, we have various other events, the community events that we're going to be attending throughout the year. There's going to be the, the token launch, of course. Uh, later on in the year the palm token launch and just yeah we're just going to keep grinding at it we will not stop the future looks really bright for us i'm really really excited about this really psyched and again this would have not been possible without the help of the community and we really really 
cherish that relationship that we have with the community. Well, it sounds like a really exciting year that you have coming up. So if people share that vision with you and they want to get involved, how do they do it? Of course, we would love to have you delegate to our pools, Palm 1 and Palm 2 for the Palm ISPO. And also, and this is a big part of why we love the community, is the community is really, it really engages with us on the business. And they really are there, not just to support us and say, you're doing a good job, but to bring us opportunities to reach out to us and say, hey, guys, you know, I know this commodity producer, this commodity or this region or this particular problem that you might have, you might have, the Palmyra might have a solution for. And so this is actually part of our decentralized business development initiative that we're going to be putting out there, uh, which is part of the, uh, the token economy, the Palm token economy. And so I asked the community to keep doing that, to reach out to us, reach out to any member of the Zengate team. Let us know if you have any ideas. Let us know if you have a way to make what we're building better. We're always open and always welcome and always excited to get your input. Great, Daniel. Theodore, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It was great catching up with you, and I'm really looking forward to see what comes next. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Joseph, thanks for being on the show with us today. Can you give the audience a brief introduction? I'm Joseph Arminio. I work with the Ergo Foundation in terms of uh, kind of the core organization of like community tooling as well as external partnerships. Uh, I also am a co-founder of Rosenbridge. So tell us about Rosenbridge. How does it work? Rosenbridge itself is a multi-layer cross-chain messaging protocol, right? And so on the top layer, you have a reporting layer. So in traditional finance, you usually go through a two-step process when you're talking about transferring money. The first is clearance, right? And so that top layer acts as a clearance layer where what happens is all of these different actors are running software that's watching specific wallets, which is like the outgoing uh, wallet. So a user will send their funds to the bridge and all of these participants right now, there's 77, both watching the Ergo chain and the Cardano chain will kind of watch and post transactions to the Ergo blockchain, right? And above a certain threshold, what will happen is it will create a notification event. And that notification event is kind of this representation of approval for the clearance process, right? At that point, it goes to the second layer, which we can call settlement, right? So once it reaches the settlement layer, you have uh, another group of actors that are going to re-audit that transaction. And once a cryptographic threshold is met, funds will be transferred across the bridge and essentially settled to the end user. So in a bridge like this, you have multiple parties and different chains involved all in this complex process. How do you ensure that transactions end up being secure and reliable? It's a matter of creating redundant auditing. So, it, you know, if you look at a transaction that actually clears through this messaging protocol, you know, it will be redundantly audited about 40 times by different actors all around the world. And so you can have a better assumption in terms of kind of the clearance or accuracy of each particular transfer, right? And one, one benefit of having this as a multi-layer system is you actually have people checking transactions on different heights of the blockchain. So if, if you have a single Oracle t just taking a snapshot, it's taking a snapshot in one point in time. And sometimes the security in terms of this idea of settlement on chains itself, you know, it can change from system to system. You know, in proof of work, we have this idea of finality that's based on the amount of energy that's added. And so, you know, the further along uh, you are on the chain, the better your assumption of finality is. In proof of stake, you have different finality assumptions, but in both systems, you have this idea of potential hacks, potential rollbacks. And so having the chain audited at different heights gives better assumptions of truth. That is a really fascinating solution. Uh, so what's the present state of development for Rosenbridge? Everything we build is open source. And this type of protocol requires transparency. That's what 
it's what it's all about, right? Transparency is trust. And when you're talking about, you know, holding collateral and, and bridging, trust is really the foundational element. So right now we're in what we call the Rosen Light era. The bridge is live. There's currently, uh, I don't know, a couple million dollars in TVL. I haven't checked that aspect in a few days, to be honest. And we're in the process of refining the system and expanding support. So we're going to go through a period of introducing new native assets to the bridge, which will help you know open this up to projects within both the Ergo and the Cardano community to start accessing external markets. The team itself has shifted as of this week towards a more research and development framework. We have two of them in parallel right now. The first is Bitcoin support. The second is Ethereum support. Now, one benefit of both of those paths is if you look across the broader crypto space, there's a lot of forks. So if you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Dogecoin or Dogecoin, you know, they're all relatively similar because they're all based on the Bitcoin framework. And when you get into EVM, uh, you basically gain access to Ethereum, but a variety of rollups and other chains that kind of piggybacked off of the original EVM framework. And so that creates a foundation that will make both Bitcoin forks and EVM forks much easier to integrate because a lot of that work and research will be reusable. So my hope is that in 2024, we start adding those two core assets. Now, for the Cardano community, Bitcoin opens up quality collateral. You know, so DeFi frameworks can start using Bitcoin as a collateralized asset and offer, you know, yield and opportunity to people that hold that. What the EVM path does, it opens markets, right? So if projects want exposure to liquidity on, say, Ethereum or uh, potentially, you know, EVM chains or rollups, right, they have the ability to list their assets in those external markets. And so one of the goals of Rosen is to try to make external markets cheaper and more accessible for projects themselves. So if that sounds good to people watching and they want to get involved, where should they go? Sure. So our main website is Rosen.tech. You know, we, there you can get links to our GitHub. Uh, we also have a variety of socials, whether it's Twitter or Telegram or Discord. You know, I'm, I'm always most excited when people hop in and ask questions, right? One nice thing about the Rosen framework is because we have, well, right now, a group of 77 watchers on each chain that are running this software. There's quite a lot of data and support and kind of community there that you can jump into and learn from. Now, we are actually in the process of expanding that watcher set, which is uh, more a function of how our smart contracts on Ergo are structured. And so at some point, you know, that threshold of 77 on the top reporting layer will actually not be limited. Right now, it's a space and size issue. We do have an engineering solution that's currently being implemented. So we may get to the point where, you know, you have 100 watchers, 200 watchers, 300 watchers, right? And so the more that each transaction is audited by independent parties across the globe, it, it creates better assumptions of truth, right? And that's ultimately uh, what is the most important thing in this type of messaging protocol is if you look at a lot of the hacks that occurred in, in 2022, the actual assumptions of, of like honesty and truth were a lot lower than were marketed, let's say. So our goal was to build a system that is end-to-end -end open source and has transparency built around transfers. Well, Joseph, thanks so much for joining us on the show and for telling us about Rosenbridge. I'm really looking forward to its future. So thanks to everybody who joined us for this month's Building on Cardano segment. And if you know of anyone that you'd like to see featured, make sure you drop us a note and reach out to us on social media. Well, that's it for January. And what a great start to the year it's been. There's a huge amount to look forward to in 2024, but looking a little closer ahead, join us next month for some highlights from the University of Edinburgh's QSIG event, which will explore the exciting opportunities in the realm of quantum cryptography. IOG is co-sponsoring the event along with the Cardano Foundation and the Ethereum Foundation. So if you'd like to learn more in the interim about this exciting new field, make sure you check out the blog link below. Next month, we'll also have an update on the further rollout of peer-to-peer -peer and a touch base with the Midnight team. 
So be sure to like, subscribe and hit that bell so you're the first to know when the show drops. Thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you in February.